Jack. Levi. Are we the crazy ones? Hey everyone. Welcome to Are We The Crazy Ones, the podcast that explores fringe perspectives in literature and on the internet. I'm Levi, and in this episode, Jack and I cover Food of the Gods by Terence McKenna. A bit of admin first. Our discussions are becoming more free-flowing as we become more comfortable recording the podcast. So, at times, we may gloss over important details during our conversation. As such, we are trialling a new format. We are adding a short intro outlining some of the key points of the work and the background of the author. I do recommend you listen to the intro because it will give you more context, but if you want to jump straight into the conversation, please skip to about the eight-minute mark. Now, on to our text for today. A folk hero amongst psychedelic explorers around the world, Terence McKenna is famous not only for taking recklessly high doses of magic mushrooms, but as one of the leading public thinkers in the psychedelic revolution. Mr. McKenna risked personal harm and political persecution during the height of the conservative backlash to the hippie counterculture of the 1960s. He was an outspoken critic of the drug war and advocated for the healthy use of psychoactive drugs in society, bravely keeping alight the psychedelic candle until his death in the year 2000 at the age of just 53. Mr. McKenna studied ecology at the University of California, Berkeley in the 1960s and 70s. He travelled extensively throughout his career and was particularly impacted by the time he spent with shamans in tribal societies of the Amazon. Arguably, his writings of his psychedelic jungle adventures helped kickstart the modern interest in psychedelic tourism in South America. McKenna was also heavily influenced by various esoteric passions, including pre-Buddhist Tibetan religion, ancient Chinese numerology, and modern psychoanalysis. His unique mixture of interests is reflected in his diverse and somewhat eccentric bibliography. In this episode, we read his most influential book, Food of the Gods, The Search for the Original Tree of Knowledge. In this watershed book on psychonautic literature, McKenna proposes stoned ape theory, a theoretical explanation of the origin of modern humans. He argues that our sophisticated cognitive functions, including complex social systems, technology and language, emerged as a direct consequence of our symbiotic relationship with psychedelic mushrooms over the many millennia of biological and cultural evolution. Perhaps more controversial than the explanations of human evolution are Mr. McKenna's moral, political, and social agenda, what he calls the archaic revival. To begin with, McKenna identifies some of the world's most challenging dangers, including ecological catastrophe, overpopulation, and the threat of nuclear war. He argues that all these dangers are the result of what he calls dominator culture, a cultural archetype that normalizes the destruction of the environment, violence, dogmatic monotheism, patriarchy, and social domination. Mr. McKenna proposes that our global society is in dire need of large-scale reform based on the values of pre-agricultural shamanistic societies. These so-called partnership cultures are antithetical to dominator cultures in that they value an elevation of the feminine and a matriarchal spirituality, a symbiotic relationship with nature, egalitarianism, orgiastic sexual liberation, and a deep connection with the mystical and the divine. Of course, Such a sick civilization as ours that is in desperate need of such radical transformation needs potent medicine. Dr. McKenna prescribes the revival of psychedelic plant experiences as a necessary course of treatment. Taking Mr. McKenna's lead, we might hazard a guess that the archetypes of the dominator culture and the partnership culture run very deep indeed. This ancient clash of cultural archetypes points not merely to a societal conflict between the various factions of our earliest ancestors, but points to something more fundamental and more biological. A keen analysis such as Mr. McKenna's reveals that this clash of cultures is still echoing down the ages in the society we have inherited from our forebears. In fact, the story of this conflict is imprinted in our very DNA and is therefore in the characteristic behaviours that make us uniquely human. Obviously, psychoactive drugs in use within a particular society can affect the minds and perspectives of the people taking them, people who then of course go on to participate in the rest of the culture. It is here that we find a potential mechanism for Mr. McKenna's argument. 1. Human minds create culture. 2. Psychoactive drugs have a profound impact on our minds. 3. Our culture forms a crucial element of our environment. 4. Combining 1, 2 and 3, psychoactive drugs are capable of profoundly impacting our cultural environment and so could have played an important role in our biological and sociological evolutionary story. But 5. In the modern West, we live in a global dominator culture which has been shaped by the malicious use of drugs, of social control and moral degeneracy, such as alcohol, that are authorised by, complement and contribute to dominator values. Blinded by the internal logic of our own cultural setting, we have completely overlooked the role of our relationship with drugs in general 
and all but annihilated our once generative relationship with psychedelics. This seems to be the crux of his argument. The mushroom forms a symbiotic relationship with humans not only through the psychological and physical changes whilst under the influence. The mushroom is also symbiotic with human society writ large by shifting our cultural landscape and affecting genetic evolution over the course of many generations. If I may take some liberty, we could draw a loose parallel to how humans have changed dogs over the course of our long interspecies friendship. The shift from wolf to domesticated dog under the guidance of humans is analogous to the shift from primate to modern human under the guidance of the mushrooms. Two species have lived together so intimately over such vast spans of time that one has quite literally changed the life and the livelihood of the other. McKenna's ideas have been criticised as pseudoscientific, and Jack and I pull no punches in our criticisms or jokes about many parts of the book. However, there are perspectives that are potentially valuable, regardless of the scientific validity of the work. Looking at our society from the lens of our past, McKenna's stoned ape theory tells us that the drugs our society chose to allow or disallow in prior generations has had a profound impact on present-day moral and institutional realities that affect people all over the globe. This impact can be seen not merely in the lack of access to potentially useful and therapeutic drugs, like many of the plant-based psychedelics, but it can also be seen in the many other parts of our global society's war on drugs. From the tragedy of drug-funded organised crime in Central America, to the unjust incarceration of non-violent drug users across the world. On the other hand, looking at our society from the lens of our potential futures, his subversively hopeful idea of the archaic revival would point us to the conclusion that the recent trends of progressive drug policy reforms in the West will have equally far-reaching and profound impacts on the ethical and social realities of our children and for many generations to come. McKenna's ideas might be on the fringe. However, his life work his legacy, and many of his views are being vindicated by the recent groundbreaking research on the beneficial effects of psychedelics. McKenna's story, like many stories of people who venture into the strange and wonderful world of psychedelics, teaches us that sometimes the fringe may contain important wisdom that the rest of us desperately need to hear, but we cannot hear because we are too normal, perhaps too sober, and we cannot hear the message until the damage is already done. Taking a leaf out of Lex Friedman's book, I'm going to paraphrase Alexander Solzhenitsyn. The line separating good and evil, separating partnership and dominator, passes right through each one of us, through every human heart and through all human hearts. Perhaps, deep in the darkness of our primeval past, it was our ancient psychedelic plant friends that helped us see clearly this line between good and evil. Now, in the early 2020s, living in the shadow of the pandemic and the wake of possible climate catastrophe, perhaps it is our dearest and oldest of friends, the magic mushroom, that can help us to see that line running through each of our hearts clearly once more. And now, comrades, Jack and I read Food of the Gods by Terence McKenna. Before reading Food of the Gods, I don't, I don't remember when I first came across Terence McKenna. Maybe because the, probably the first encounters with him that I've had are when we listen to, to recordings of him talking about taking magic mushrooms when we were less than sober, or maybe more than sober. <laughs> when, when, we were, when we were on magic mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or something. Probably, probably, probably something. <laughs> yeah, so within... Or more than sober, yes. Within McKenna's paradigm, when we were far more than sober, when we were... Suffering from an excess of reality, rather than too little. An excess of it. Far, That's when I first encountered reality. <laughs> yes, re- reality was uh, entering our brains at high velocity. <laughs> when did you first come across so, it? That's a really bloody. Good, good you don't question. remember it. <laughs> it's something along the lines of. It must have been. In. 2017 or 2018 when I really started getting into psychedelics <laughs> and undoubtedly somehow ended up finding out about Terence McKenna as as one does if you just type in psychedelics into into YouTube at some point you'll come across a Terence McKenna video plus also Rogan talks about Terence McKenna and he's had uh he's had Terence McKenna's brother on Dennis McKenna oh that's still right in the psychedelic in the in the uh roof psychedelic revival movement i suppose for lack of a better word mm-hmm. 
Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> it's a whole thing. For you lucky listeners, we're going to unpack the, the seeds of the psychedelic revival movement today. The food of the gods. Seeds so why did spores, we... if we're discussing mushrooms. More the spores of spores. the revival. Primarily spores. Like, nice uh, kind of blue spores. Nice purpley blue spores. Yeah. That'd be good. So, so Terence McKenna wrote this book... By, by the standards of our podcast, at least, in quite a lucid way, in a well-structured way, again, within the paradigm of Are We The Crazy Ones? So we're, we're going to more or less follow his structure with some discursions, with probably, probably yeah, quite a the... few of those, but we'll mostly follow his structure. And it's structured somewhat like... <laughs> like Dante's, Dante's divine comedy. Yeah, the um Yeah. It's a it's a saga about humanity's one-time paradise, losing that paradise, descending to hell and then regaining it or a proposition for how to regain it for the future. It ends on quite an optimistic note. And and naturally the paradise was littered with psychedelic mushrooms. Oh, dude. Absolutely was was food predicated the gods. on enjoying the food of the gods, and if you have not guessed yet, that that food is psychedelic mushrooms. All right, so and the first part of the book is titled Paradise, and it's basically <laughs> <laughs> it's paradise, uh, it's a psychedelic it's, African it's, savanna paradise. <laughs> it's a quote unquote scientific exploration of uh an explanation of human evolution. Basically, McKenna proposes uh the jump from sort of proto hominid to humans, especially sort of modern humans with our cognitive capacities for like universal language and a, a, a very sophisticated sort of extended phenotype, behavioral phenotype and complex societies and all that sort of stuff. Um, that leap from sort of, you know, early humans or our sort of ape ancestors to modern humans was catalyzed, I suppose, or perhaps even caused directly by a sort of what, what McKenna refers to as a quasi symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. with uh psychedelic plants in particular psilocybin containing mushrooms yeah and is, a, uh, is that a is that a reasonable high level entry point that's a that's a very reasonable entry point i would also like to say as a preface to the the small number of people listening the even smaller number <laughs> watching mckenna constantly talks about plant intelligence and includes within that magic mushrooms. Both Levi and I are aware that mushrooms are not plants. They're fungi. So if anyone so were any wanting to, to write in or make a snarky there. comment, we, we are aware of this. We're just remaining true to the source material in which and I believe mushrooms are plants. See, see McKenna was a botanist he, 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 uh, or an ecologist by training. He actually trained at Berkeley and he... Bsi, I think, was in uh, eth ethnology. Eth, is that the correct word? As so. in like entheogens. A anyways, um, basically like plants and stuff and <laughs> science. And and he knows the difference between plants and like fungi and mushrooms and stuff. But I think he's just using it as a catch-all term for just like yeah. organic matter. Yeah, plants and mushrooms yeah, for the. Uh... The planetary vegetable matrix. <laughs> yeah. So, so, before, so go on, before yeah. we even talk about human evolution or hominid evolution, thanks to eating magic mushrooms, how about we talk about what habits are, habits and addictions? Because this is this is the foundation of most of the book, or this this concept underlies much of the book, the idea of yep. habits and addictions. And he, really early on, 
in the section called An Agonising Reappraisal, he sets out the <laughs> spectrum of, of, of potential states between habits and addictions. So he, he says that a habit is a settled tendency or practice. And habits are neither good nor bad. They're, they're neutral. They're just what, what people or animals more generally do. But once, once pursuit of a habit crosses a, a largely culturally defined barrier, once you pursue it to a greater extent than the culture within which you're situated deems acceptable or normal, that becomes an obsession. And it's yeah. viewed dimly because it's seen as a reduction in your free will. If that continues even further, it becomes an addiction. And so he, he says, oh, sorry. No, no, go on. So, uh, there's a nice quote where he kind of sums it up. Uh, Habit, obsession, addiction. These words are signposts along a path of ever decreasing free will. Yeah. Denial of the power of free will is implicit in the notion of addiction. And in our culture, addictions are viewed seriously, especially exotic or unfamiliar addictions. Yeah. So just to give the guy credit, like, he's an okay writer i quite like to, how he compared writes. to compared to, to compared to varg he is oh man like, <laughs> yeah he is an amazing incredible writer mm-hmm. uh so it's fine it, it's not the worst thing to read so you'll see his quotes are understandable he actually yeah. knows how to write <laughs> he yeah he 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 does write fairly well. He really likes the word Adam Bright and just keeps keeps using it, which is a bit distracting. If you're going to use a weird word, maybe yeah. Use it he was once definitely one of those kids it. in year twelve, in year twelve, who like picked a couple of key words to use on their assignment and was like, I'm on their like English English yeah. essays. Like I know these words will make me sound smarter than I actually am, so I'm just going to keep on hitting those words. Yeah, it sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> a dumbrate cornucopia cornucopia <laughs> yeah a pharmacological cornucopia but the why I, why i wanted to bring up habits obsessions addictions is because those feed into his definition of a drug and he defines drug super broadly and only defines it right at the end of the book because he'll define things like tv and sugar as drugs and initially in my notes i was scribbling all over them saying no nah, that's just not a drug but he, he, he defines a drug very late and his definition is consistent through the book, but, but so only makes sense once, once you know it. So he says that a drug is something that causes unexamined, obsessive and habitual behavior. So super broad definition. But yeah, he should have at least tacked in like an exogenous stimuli. To that oh, yeah i mean i guess you could become obsessed with some thought inside your own mind yeah <laughs> and it would qualify as a drug under that and it, it does bring up the interesting i mean you question. could say under that definition like an ideology is a drug but i am yeah but i uh, but i I, th- I think he, he does <laughs> define them almost as drugs his definition of drug is yeah. really broad but it brings up the really yeah. interesting question under his well, within his framework are psychedelics drugs because i so, no, no, no. So I thought it was interesting, at least by his definition of drugs, for me personally, I'm not sure that psychedelics would, <laughs> would qualify as drugs because they're not habitual. I do not want to try these things habitually. It is not unexamined behavior. I'm more than aware of when, coffee, I'm, when I've taken them. Yeah, something like, something like what I'm drinking right now. Like this, this is a drug by Terry's. Yeah. According to Terry's metric, acid is not. Anyway, that depends on the dosage. Depends on the dosage. Yeah, that that was a that was a discursion. <laughs> I promised I promised that we'd go through chronologically with discursions, and I've already fulfilled the promise. So, <laughs> so human evolution. He he breaks down human culture into two broad categories. The first of which is. Uh, antecedent to chronologically to to the second and the first one is uh like what he would call like the archaic or the the part he calls them partnership cultures and 
And then the second one, which she calls Dominator Cultures, and essentially uh, archaic partnership cultures were sort of like the early cultures, human or proto-human cultures, and they were about like living in partnership with one another and the environment um, in various forms. Whereas dominator cultures were like to do with strong hierarchies, particularly uh, patriarchal hierarchies, where people were being dominated, so like class structures, and then the environment or the world was being dominated by it, by those cultures. Um, so basically, we live now in a dominator culture, Western culture, modern Western culture, and the techno-economic system we live under is kind of a dominator culture. But he's kind of positing in this book, like there's this alternative way of living, these partnership cultures that you see in like indigenous societies or shamanic societies in like Central and South America or where, wherever. And in fact, we need to kind of like, quote unquote, go back to archaic culture and revive those things. And he calls, I think he calls it a neo-archaic or something like yeah, that. Yeah, archaic <laughs> Shamanism. revival. The archaic revival. Is that a rough... And... And, and basically, psychedelic mushrooms like feed into into this distinction insofar as getting getting high on psilocybin will do a bunch of things, including making you more loving of your neighbor, I suppose, and mm -hmm. more more connected to nature. It will also increase visual acuity and make you horny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, oh, there there is so much to talk about, which is why. Well, th this is what people listen for. They they listen for our highly structured, <laughs> thoroughly scientific conversation. We've already I fulfilled mean, we, your promise. We can we can we can now discourse as much as we like. Yeah, we we are. Well, what did you think about this we, idea? We are, of we are commensurate dom, dom. as we are commensurately disordered as the things we read. That is to say, highly Ooh. disordered. So, <laughs> yeah, maybe even before human evolution, we can talk about what what society once was because. McKenna sets this book out. Yeah. He tells you what society yeah. used to be and why it was really, really good. And then he, he sets about... His, his ultimate goal is how to get back to that point. So he tells you what was great in the past and why the world now is terrible. And then yeah. he talks about how that old Eden, the archaic shamanic paradise, came about in what it was. Central Western, then, Western Africa. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Then it's how we're going to get back there. So let's let's talk about shamanism even before we promise people human evolution and that will come. But let's talk about shamanism. Something well, probably come up before we get to shamanism man. too. Give me some of that shaman shamanism. All man. right. So <laughs> So what so like what is what is shamanism? Like from a high level you can think of it as like okay in sort of pre-agricultural societies mm -hmm. to use that that sort of classification uh such as you know various indigenous cultures around the world there'll be like a medicine person a medicine man somebody responsible for the administration of like medicines and they may also overlap with like the person authorized and responsible for running certain types of ceremonies mm -hmm. ritual rituals um so in the context of like indigenous Australia, that would be things like administering like, okay, doing a psychedelic ceremony um, at the end of an, an initiation ceremony for like uh, young men or like those sorts of things. And in the, the most famous one around the world, would the two most famous of these ceremonies would be like the ayahuasca ceremony in central, mm -hmm. in the Amazon, in central and South America. And the other one, would be uh, maybe, maybe the other one that people would have heard of would, would be the peyote ceremony because it's sort of like American. So that's in Arizona and sort of Mexico, the Native American tribes around there have peyote ceremonies and the person responsible for delivering those you could think of as like a medicine person, shaman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in McKenna's telling, some of the most important characteristics of shamans are that they are masters of language. They commune yeah. with, with some sort of world outside of our own or running in parallel with our own, which is real. It's, it's not... Ex this, is, this is not some... This, this is not just an altered sensorium from taking 
psychedelic compounds. This is communing with a real place. This is real. Maybe yeah. more real. Yeah. And they are masters of ecstasy. He he takes very seriously this idea that they enter an ecstatic state upon However, ecstatic these, doesn't these just compounds. mean like uh just like getting high, right? No, it's, it's not a bit fun. more nuanced than that. No. Yeah, he um so there, there's a quote from the the chapter Shamanism and the Lost Archaic World where where he says Consider a shaman who uses plants to converse with an invisible world inhabited by non-human intelligences. That that sums up a lot of his view of what shamans do. They enter another world. Th- most most uh, most consistently, or the 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 best path to this alternate world is using psychedelic drugs but it can be reached in other ways like breathing exercises meditation abstinence from sex fasting for long mm. periods drumming and they they commune with other intelligences to heal people so the interesting thing about this though and the reason why McKenna is important and I guess I'll make sure that I include this in the opening is that um Terence McKenna was actually really impacted by his ex- direct experiences with uh, "quote unquote" shamanic cultures, like mm-hmm. for basically for essentially kid from like California studies botany at UT Berkeley, runs down to Central and South America into the Amazon to take to take a bunch of take a bunch of drugs with his, with his brother and his friends, and um, and. With, with with shamans from from the indigenous peoples uh, throughout that that area, and uh, he he basically arguably he he was one of the very early influential, potentially uh, the the most impactful modern person to like uh, in, introduce psychedelics into Western. Into, into the United States in particular, but with the Western world. Um, and in particular, uh, because of the books that he wrote, like people started going down to Central and South America to like find these mushrooms and find, and find the ayahuasca and all that sort of stuff. And now, you know, it's a, it's a booming industry that employs many, many <laughs> people or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, so he, he's writing about this uh, shamanism stuff quite a long time after he had direct experience experience with it and came back and he actually gives like talks at universities or he used to give talks at universities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this, this shamanism, one of the most important functions that it served was to retain a link to the feminine nature of the earth or what he calls the planetary vegetable intelligence or planetary vegetable matrix, which keeps humanity <laughs> within a partnership paradigm rather than a dominator paradigm. In fact, he calls Strophaeria cubensis, which is the, the particular type of magic mushroom that he feels was the, the so-called ur plant, the, the plant that kicked off the human food. evolution. He oh calls it the, <laughs> the umbilicus to the feminine mind of the planet. Yeah, he really views the world through like a a classical dichotomy of feminine and masculine that you might yeah. see talked about in like sort of Hindu cultures, uh, the Hinduism and yogic stuff, or you know, it's a classic sort of archetypical yeah. <laughs> way of breaking the gender genders down, and he views like dominator cultures. As as like hyper masculine, overly masculine, and subjugation of feminine, mm-hmm. femininity, feminine, and women, and this uh, plant allowing us to connect uh, to the feminine part of the earth and our culture is part of the reason why it's so good. On that, Jack, 
What's really interesting is he 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 reimagines the Genesis story, the Garden of Eden, uh, in light of this uh, hypothesis of his. So the tree, the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, he reinterprets as 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 the mushroom, <laughs> and falling out of Eden could potentially be like okay, like our descent from our partnership society. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what I don't know what to make of that. It's just like he he just pulls up like random bits of he nitpicks bits of like literature or mythology from whether it's he he quotes stuff from the Vedas, the mm-hmm. Hindu Vedas. He quotes stuff from the Bible. He quotes stuff from like various other religions. Um, and mythologies to support his his view, um, and basically trying to make parallels, try to draw parallels between his hypothesis of this plant causing this cultural shift, and like, well, here's bits of text or religious stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I found I found that uncompelling. <laughs> i Personally, feel like I yeah he know. he definitely throughout the book he he plays it being scientific he plays it saying well we're not positive what the garden of eden is we're not positive what caused hominid evolution what caused things like the development of more sophisticated language that you find in modern humans versus say apes or our yeah. our evolutionary forebears but then he'll having having provided that that conditionality he'll then go on to discuss his theory as if it is established and yeah. he'll just he'll yeah, dismiss yeah. other theories because they conflict with his purported hypotheses that he really takes to be fact yeah he clearly just flat out believes it mm. and he he tries to hedge it in in language that he can have some plausible deniability that he's not mm. just being totally cooked <laughs> yeah but if, if say for example when he's talking about cultural evolution he says oh well we have no good explanations for why cultural evolution takes place at such a rapid pace and you think oh but i mean we kind of do say if you read david deutsch's work so he proposes yeah, which what everybody I would, which yeah. every, everybody yeah. should read obviously like he he came after mckenna he wrote many of his books after so, Terence mckenna but you might even say he he is in the footsteps of mckenna yeah <laughs> david, <laughs> david deutsch <laughs> there's mckenna and there's david deutsch <laughs> yeah. yeah but say say with ideas of mimesis or mimetic evolution we we do have we do have frameworks within which you can describe how cultural evolution works. However, McKenna just goes on to dismiss all of those because he says they don't factor in the essential role of magic mushrooms. So he's, <laughs> he's already decided that he's right, but he They're tries to couch powerful. it in terms of, oh, I'm being scientific. I'm leaving open the possibility that I'm wrong. But he... <laughs> That's window dressing. Okay, he is sure that he's he's correct. He's he knows. Oh man, he knows I, something that we see, don't. I really. Here's the thing, Jack. I I really liked McKenna before reading this <laughs> 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 because because to me McKenna was this kind of kind of zany guy on YouTube. I could watch while I was high and have some weird thoughts and be like, Whoa, <laughs> this guy, like, he's got this video and he, he's got a very, everybody should go and watch videos of this guy. He's got so a, he's, got, he's the got the perfect voice for someone who he's loves. Got the perfect voice. He is, he looks and sounds like the sort of guy who took a shitload of mushrooms in his life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And he's got these videos on YouTube and people have cut them up. They're, they're amazing when to listen to when you're intoxicated. And, it's like to me that was enough, <laughs> you know. Like to me that was like <laughs> this is, that's fine. I don't actually need to unpack your perspectives. Mm. And now I've I've learned too much. I've I've had the veil lifted 
from my eyes and I now <laughs> actually know what is going on inside McKenna's head. <laughs> oh, then you're not impressed? I am. Um, see, okay, see, the problem is that actually quite a lot of the book is actually quite fine. It's just like history of like drugs and th- there's a lot of history, which I assume is probably reasonable, reasonably well researched. There's some pharmacology stuff, which is reasonably well written and it's not too bad. But then all the stuff around the archaic, the neo-archaicism and like the revival of the archaic culture and the dominator partnership culture mm-hmm. stuff, I was just like, mate, get the fuck off it. Like you don't like, this is just such, such a... Uh, I got a real... I don't think he yeah, meant to be patronising, but it felt a He's quite incredibly patronising patronizing noble <laughs> savage. It's Look at these nice, simple people who... So who are in in touch with nature, they intuitively understand the world. It was like when he was talking about the problem of agriculture, how it meant that women who were traditionally so in touch with nature's bounty and understood it at an intuitive level, <laughs> learned to do things like grow crops <laughs> and and lost lost their innate feminine knowledge of how how to live in in perfect unity with the natural world. Oh, there were just so many eye roll moments. Like, this guy, this is like the Bible of hippie, of hippies. This thing, if you're a hippie, if you want to become a hippie, or if, if, you know, if that's a life goal of yours, um, you've got to read this book. (laughs) Oh, no, no. I don't even reckon it's it's, it's the Bible of being a hippie. It's the Bible of one person. No, and and, and, and it's, it's the amazing superposition. It's... (laughs) <laughs> How one person can be many people at the same time. Everyone listening will know at least one person whose entire identity is smoking weed. <laughs> like it's, it's okay if you smoke weed. That, that doesn't make you this person. You become this person when smoking weed is your personality. They're the type of person who will, within five minutes of meeting anyone, tell them all of the benefits of the hemp industry and how good it is, how good a cloth <laughs> it is, how it cures everything. They will tell you that they're cutting down on their weed. They don't smoke that much, just, you know, three or four <laughs> times a day. They will, t- they will try to convince you that weed cures everything, that you, know, you can cure cancer, <laughs> Alzheimer's, and schizophrenia at the same time if you just, like, yeah. have your edibles each morning. They will... Point you towards a YouTube channel with 38 subscribers where some guy <laughs> still making videos in Windows Movie Maker will tell you about how the CIA <laughs> are trying to control your mind using coffee and fir trees or something like that. Like, this person should read Food of the Gods. <laughs> this is their book. They don't know it yet. But if you smoke, if you smoke enough weed... If you, if you do it, if you, if you really go hard on the bongs, you will probably actually develop an innate knowledge of Food of the Gods anyway. You I think you'll just commune with you'll McKenna. You'll just commune across with the McKenna. Board. You will just you'll download, download into your mind. his wisdom. You know, the, the LSD downloads that you get on the, the dance floor at, at, at pitch or whatever the fuck. Like, you'll be visited. Like, McKenna will be like Yoda. <laughs> Yoda and Obi-Wan. It'll be little Rogan as Yoda, Yoda and McKenna showing up as Obi-Wan teaching you about the food of the gods and how our our ancestors developed complex universal languages by getting smoked on acid. <laughs> well, not on acid. No, that was... On, on, sorry, on shrooms. Yes, acid is the modern yeah. development. You've got to be sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, psilocybin. They munched enough magic mushrooms to jump from apes <laughs> to, to hominids. Yeah, so the other thing I found was that he, his... His style of oh, also firstly, yes, I do, I do know. So I, I do know at least one person like that. <laughs> I think everyone does. If if you if you smoke enough weed and if you embrace it as an identity, you become the same one person. You become the yeah, same. Yeah, you, you also have to spend. Uh, you also watch every single documentary put out by the History Channel. <laughs> Put out by the History Channel and you recommend to everyone DMT, the spirit molecule, that documentary. <laughs> that, 
That just We're somehow <laughs> becomes narrated a really by Joe Rogan. Part of his person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we keep teasing that we're going to actually talk about this book. We really should at some point. How about let's 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 discuss hominid evolution. Well, we can discuss hominid evolution and then go on to McKenna's quest to find what was the catalyst for hominid evolution. And so so plot, Jack, plot spoiler, view... it's magic mushrooms. <laughs> just... Strafaria cubensis. <laughs> McKenna analyzed many alternatives. <laughs> he analyzed and many he alternatives. To, knowing, yeah, he set out with no preconceived ideas, and he just happened to deduce logically that magic mushrooms must have been the catalyst. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so Jack, I just want to human ask evolution. You a question, as we're going to talk about human evolution, right? What? to you is fundamentally humans like what is it about us that separates us from say other hominids that are now extinct or even other other like apes well since you've since you've set it up that nicely levi i would say <laughs> it's our self-awareness <laughs> and primarily our linguistic capacity <laughs> Does that sound sufficiently in line with what McKenna proposed? <laughs> no, I'm asking you, Jack. Don't don't parrot. Don't don't just parrot to me what McKenna says. What do you think fundamentally separates us? I don't think there's any firm line. I would say I would say we exist on a spectrum of say self awareness, linguistic mm. capacity. Things like tool use, the ability to socially organise, the ability to undergo cultural evolution in a very flexible way. We we have these particular attributes to a greater extent than other animals, but I don't think there's. And do they all come from like a single? Do they come from even if there's not a single line? Because even within humans, there's like some diversity of like you know people have you know different linguistic capacities or whatever. <laughs> uh, but um, is, do you think all of those, that sort of nexus of traits come from potentially like a single wellspring? Like, I don't know if you want to, would want to, I probably would be, uh, I would not be inclined to boil it down to a single mutation, but kind of a, a single kind of underlying difference. It's hard to, it's hard to pinpoint something. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's not at a single gene locus. Um, it's, His, it's no, no, of course not a single gene locus. <laughs> you have the so human my, gene. My, you stick I've it in th- anything and it just becomes <laughs> a person. Stick it in a fruit fly and it'll become a person. And immediately start asking for magic mushrooms. So, having said that, yeah. could... My, how did <laughs> humans get to this psych- point? Could psychics... Could, how, how did we go from a dumb, stupid little ape running around on the savannah... Hitting each other with sticks mm. and and to the and to the unbounded whatever. phenotype, to the unbounded universal extended phenotype of How did we Elon Musk dumb ape putting a, a Tesla coin. around Mars to Dogecoin <laughs> to 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 Joe Rogan, Terence McKenna, NFTs and, and video games. games. How did and, we get to NFTs this this and Diablo point. three? So, so <laughs> how did we get to this point? Well, let's consult, how about I a, open science, it up? let's consult a serious scientist. Back to the text. Yeah, well, how about I'll, I'll open this, this up with a quote, which will lead into, which, which we can pull out. There are a lot of threads hanging off this one. So. <laughs> this is an entire spatial thread. <laughs> Here we go. There's, a, there's many threads hanging off this. This is kind of a crux of the argument. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll do two quotes. These are these are really good quotes from the section called "You Are What You Eat," which might give a clue to how humans evolve. <laughs> so the first quote: "Eating a plant or an animal is a way of claiming its power, a way of assimilating its magic to oneself." Okay, so bear that in mind. <laughs> he goes on to say, "The strategy of the early hominid omnivores 
was to eat everything that seemed food-like and to vomit whatever was unpalatable. Plants, insects and small animals found edible by this method were then inculcated into their diet. A changing diet or an omnivorous diet means exposure to an ever-shifting chemical equilibrium. An organism may regulate this chemical input through internal processes, but ultimately mutagenic influences will increase and a greater than usual number of genetically variant individuals will be offered up to the process of natural selection. The results of this natural selection are accelerated changes in neural organization, states of consciousness and behavior. No change is permanent. Each gives way to yet another. All flows. Sorry for the pauses. My handwriting is absolutely atrocious and it's a bit hard to read sometimes. So from, we can unpack that quote. There's a lot here to unpack. And within this lies the secret of human evolution. <laughs> Humanity itself. And he's, he, he is, of course, using the foremost in neo-Darwinist theory to support his logic here. <laughs> Yeah, let's, let's Richard, Richard Dawkins has written him a letter back in time to ask for some tips. <laughs> Rich Dawkins, move the fuck over. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Terence is here. <laughs> Culture is a cage. <laughs> <laughs> so, basically, what what sparked the beginning of evolution from dumb idiot hominids to humans? Was something to... in the diet, something mutagenic. So, now, of course. So there, there, it there, there have was. Been... You've, you've got, you've got dumb monkeys, right? You've got, you've got our ancestors who hadn't discovered. Look how this dumb mutagenic. they were. Yeah, really dumb. Running around, really dumb. in the savanna, mm. and being eaten by tigers, mm. not being omnivorous, right? There's climate change. <laughs> climate change made, made it so that our ancestors had to be omnivorous. They needed to, to accommodate these changes to their environment and eat more things. They became omnivorous. Being omnivorous is mutagenic, right? There were new opportunities for natural selection and the accumulation of traits would eventually lead to the ability for humans to have this, this unbounded phenotype. So we started sampling all of these different foods, spitting out whatever we couldn't eat, maybe dying if it were really toxic. But we eventually built up a repertoire of things that we knew we could eat. And some of these things were not only nutritious, but psychedelic. <laughs> so, a different type of nutritious. A different type of nutrition for reality, not just for the body. <laughs> and with, with discovering these psychedelic compounds, the aspects of humanity that make us us were accentuated. And it's, look, it, it's kind of hard to work out what precisely he means by these psychedelic compounds providing a mutagenic stimulus. He, he's not totally consistent. He's not the most consistent writer. <laughs> who would no, have no one who we've who spent read have been consistent apart from three the decades of his life taking magic mushrooms would be a very coherent writer. <laughs> well, he, he might be operating at a level of coherence above <laughs> that which we can understand. <laughs> Given that we, we haven't should, fried our brains with concerted <laughs> use of psychedelics. So we haven't maybe we just my, haven't taken enough psychedelics, Jack. Yeah. Okay. So my my most charitable interpretation of what he means by accelerating human evolution is that there are certain traits which have proven to be extremely advantageous. So so the high linguistic so wait, just be, capacity of a modern human. Just before we jump into that, yeah. Jack, just just as a note. By mutagen, he just means like something that can alter DNA. So yeah. a classic example would be like uh, UV radiation from my son mm. can act as a mutagen and those mutations in the case of skin cancer is aberrant mutations. But the fact is UV has come in, mutated some of the DNA. So he's saying that the, the food 
the, the psychedelic mushrooms. The, there's something specifically about the psychedelic compounds such as psilocybin in the human nervous system that was causing mm-hmm. mutations that were able to be passed down from generation to generation and were a locus of natural selection. Yeah. So, again, I, I'm being as generous as I can be here and trying to keep <laughs> be his, generous. View, his view of accelerated human evolution in line with how the, 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 the broader scientific consensus of what constitutes evolution and how evolution yes. functions. So, Go on. So, my... Professional internet anthropologist reading of this was PhD. That, yeah, <laughs> in internet PhD in internet anthropology is that there are certain characteristics which are advantageous to humans, and such as having a big dick. Such as yeah, that being foremost. <laughs> but then there are ones of secondary importance like <laughs> language, visual acuity, <laughs> executive planning, yeah. Yeah, modeling yeah, executive the future. Planning. All secondary, All secondary to, having, to having, having a big dick. And, yeah, an inconveniently large dick. <laughs> All these secondary characteristics gorillas. are enhanced Little tiny by dicks. eating magic mushrooms. Look at humans. Who's going extinct? Gorillas are. Exactly. Exactly. And it's because they haven't discovered <laughs> magic mushrooms. And so... Magic mushrooms have a number of benefits unqualified benefits one of these that terence mckenna notes is they improve visual acuity in low doses he, he, he <laughs> that's a key that's like a key it's like in, in low doses so <laughs> definitely do he, not increase visual acuity no doses. there is research roland fisher in the 1960s the late 60s he gave students low doses of psilocybin psilocybin is the uh, psilocybin and psilocin, but it, it's one of the, the active ingredients in magic mushrooms. It's one of the reasons why you would eat these preferentially to porcini mushrooms. <laughs> that he gave them low doses, and the students who'd been given psilocybin were more able. They, they picked more quickly than the control group without magic mushrooms. The moment when two lines stopped being parallel. Okay? So... It has been definitively proven. I didn't look into this study. He just, Terrence McKenna just said it. I don't know how big it was. I didn't fact check any of the claims in this book. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I I should say he doesn't cite anything in this book, but I'm assuming that this was an enormous stage three clinical trial. (laughs) At least 50,000 participants that has categorically proved that taking magic mushrooms at low And has been... Has been reproduced many times by independent organisations. <laughs> well, by, by us. Published in science. Yeah. By, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's certainly increased my visual acuity. Yeah, when so when, when you take magic the mushrooms Eldritch and the gods. walls start breathing, that's not because you're hallucinating. It's actually because the walls are always breathing. <laughs> you're just seeing it clearly now. <laughs> you're just so, seeing them clearly. <laughs> so. You're seeing the non-parallel lines of the walls. Obviously, converge. this helps you hunt. Clearly. If, if you had to choose between attacking a lion with a spear sober or having just taken a slug of cubies, then <laughs> clearly, <laughs> clearly you'd prefer to be high when you're doing it. And because so, think, you need your spear when you're hunting an animal or your, your arrow or your, your, your uh, stone from your slingshot to travel in a straight line or in, in a trajectory that you can estimate. Accurately, so mm. clearly, visual acuity is incredibly important for yeah. early hominids to have a selective advantage compared to compared to their. Well, this is the other thing. He doesn't talk about other hominid species, but I assume compared to other hominid species. Yeah, compared to the dumbasses who weren't getting fried on mushrooms, <laughs> the, the ones the ones who were taking mushrooms did better. They just they hunt better. And so, trait number two. Trait one, good for men, visual acuity. Trait number two, this is good for women. This is, so, Terence McKenna's view of what constitutes men and women was, and is, is, very modern. Men, <laughs> men like killing things. Women like and talking. Hunting. 
Women like talking. Yes. <laughs> yes. So um, facts. <laughs> so facts. Yeah. So, <laughs> and th- and this is why magic mushrooms are good, are, are better for women than for men. So, women take them. Women in hunter gatherer societies were the gatherers. They they need to be good with language. They need to be able to remember where stuff to pick, where all the good berries, where the good mushroom patches are. They need to remember these places. They need to communicate the locations of these places to other women. They need to coordinate the group while the men are out fried on mushrooms, throwing spears and rocks at things with their enhanced visual acuity. Women are back at home looking for food, foraging, talking to each other. They take I feel mushrooms, like they, they could get, benefit they get from better some enhanced visual acuity. Well, I mean, yeah, of course the women have enhanced visual acuity because they've been taking mushrooms, but they're not so much using But to pick berries... Yeah, to pick berries. They can see the berries better. But more importantly, the whole time they're talking... <laughs> McKenna knows, when you're hunting, it's a stoic activity. You're, you're sitting there. You're not, you don't want to coordinate. You're, you're out to on the plains. You're just sitting there with your spear. Waiting there to is no something. point at which the hunters sit down and come up with any sort of like strategy. No, no, no. That, that <laughs> and is, that communicate is not to one another. That is not Complex energy. ideas about the landscape. No, that, none of that. They no. just get the spears... And they go out on the savannah. <laughs> anyone, anyone who has spent time in a group of men knows that men don't talk. They just sit there, periodically attack something, and the, <laughs> the ones with the greatest visual acuity do that the most successfully. That is the essence of masculinity. <laughs> High visual acuity, not much talking, spearing things. So, trait two. Science. Magic mushrooms improve linguistic proficiency so women right chatting away gathering berries having a chat good old chin wag take some mushies you get better at s- it s- speak good yeah, essentially you, you speak you speak real good so <laughs> now is so th- this is where my generous interpretation comes in because if you if you were just to take lots of mushrooms and be really good at these things that definitely helped early hominids, <laughs> that wouldn't lead to evolution. I mean, it's not... Le, Lamarck, he, he has a section on why he is not Lamarckian. So Le, Lamarck proposed that evolution happened by a single organism behaves in a certain way, gets good at something, and can then pass that knowledge on or that ability on to its offspring so say the classic example giraffes, being giraffes yeah giraffes strange to get to leaves really high up that stretched out their necks and so <laughs> that stretched neck of one giraffe is then inherited and mckenna says they, no, they i'm not, I'm not that... proposing that people take lots of mushrooms get really sharp vision and get really good at talking and give those abilities directly to their children However, he then goes on to basically behave as if that is how it operates. But I have, I have, I don't know if this is a, re- a revised McKennaism. If I can, if I can claim some sort of authorship as well for this evolutionary theory. But perhaps what he N- neo McKenna McKennaism, what what he meant to say is well, it'll now be Jackism McKennaism is that certain individuals have, have, have differing capacities for visual acuity and for linguistic capacity. I a man, clearly, am better at visual acuity and leave most of the time <laughs> to women because that's how genders work. But... So, the people who take magic mushrooms, those mushrooms allow an organism to manifest its... It's inborn capacities or inborn proclivities for good vision and good talking. And the ones who had higher innate capacities obviously were developed more with mushrooms. And so they will have more children because mushrooms have uncovered these talents that might not have been expressed otherwise. So if you're just if you're just a dumb ape, not taking mushrooms, then 
you might not be realising your potential for talking and realising that evolutionary advantage. But when you when everyone starts taking mushrooms, that's when being really good at speaking comes into its own. And they have more children. He also then says that at, at moderate doses, it's it's an aphrodisiac, taking mushrooms. So they, I still they think have his logic's anyway, like, I still all, think there's something off there super about horny. That, but I'll pay it. I'd look, I'm not saying <laughs> this is... I'm not saying. Wait, can we can we try and bridge can we try and bridge the gap there? No, no, no. no. Can we? I'm trying to salvage something that is somewhat congruent with how evolution works. Okay, because say you take it, and you say you've got two two, say just to simplify, two two people in a group of proto hominids. They both take the psychedelic mushroom, right? But one of them gets an enhan- gets say enhanced visual acuity and the other mm. one doesn't is that what he's saying that the differential uh proclivity to be affected in this way by psychedelic mushrooms or is he saying that and th- therefore the person who had that proclivity or that pre pre uh that existing uh what would you say I guess uh, potential to to be affected positively by the mushroom, they are more likely to survive. Is that what you're saying, or is that an updated way of revising it? Can we get the logic to work out here? I think that's Jack Levi McKennaism. We're we're, we're formulating a new theory because because it can't just be it can't just be that I take magic magic mushrooms and I have increased visual acuity. Therefore, I survive, and therefore I pass. What? What then? Do I just because I survive, I'm more likely to survive with better visual secure, acuity? Doesn't then mean that there is some selective mechanism happening? Then, like that's passed yeah. on. Well, hence why what I'm saying, what I'm saying, what my what my upgrade is, is that life is pretty much an RPG. <laughs> we know we know this, and so just like in RPGs. When you eat food, you get a stat boost. So, yes, the, and the, the people who get boost. greater stat boosts from eating mushrooms are the ones who survive. Because clearly, they the pass stat that boost that you get from stat boost from, down to from cubensis mushrooms are really good, and they help you. So, if you can capitalize and on this more, that's what makes you pass your genes on. The genes that get passed on are the ones that that mushrooms really like really help along. So, really, that the mushrooms are selecting which genes are present in the gene pool really so in a way in a weird way the mushrooms have actually shaped uh homo sapiens like in a in a way we are a reflection of the mushroom in our ability to think and to to form like complex language and complex society right yeah well you we have been shaped by the mushroom you're putting it too mildly. You say in a way. What Terence McKenna is saying is it's not <laughs> it just is. <laughs> this is how humans evolve. You have, you have idiot apes. They eat magic mushrooms. Boom. On the African savanna, you Because have here's the thing. Animals. Here's my only thing, Jack. Here's the thing. And I'm I, you know, I love I love Terence. I'm not not talking down about Terry. Are you gonna go and say something However, scientific? <laughs> However, I want to remind you that this is this is a reputable podcast. <laughs> we have a reputation to to maintain <laughs> <all> here. <laughs> so, my only issue is that other other animals like have been observed like getting high on psychedelic. Yeah, like those YouTube videos right? of dogs eating magic of the mushrooms. cats and like the the wild like leopards and shit. Like mushing out, and so like it, like where, like, where, 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 why, why don't we have like you know leopards roaming around the Amazon, you know having conversa- like complex conversations with each other and creating exactly. tools. And where stuff. is where is the Terence McKenna of Jack Russell Terriers as well? That's my only. That's all, 
Or inversely, like, could is he saying that if we got apes or monkeys, say you've got a bunch of, <laughs> you've got some monkeys, say some, like, monkeys that have, like, short lifespans so we can do it pretty quickly, like, uh, I don't know, like racist monkeys or something. <laughs> and we, we feed them with mushrooms <laughs> for, for enough generations <laughs> that eventually they will evolve <laughs> like a, a universal extended phenotype. Is that what he's saying? Is, that, uh, is, is Terrence saying that we should feed monkeys magic mushrooms? I think we can That's what I'm getting out next, of this. The next Planet of the Apes reboot. <laughs> the new plot <laughs> They've just got a bunch of chimps <laughs> high as a kite <laughs> so, Okay uh, And okay. what about so, level 3? So level 2 made you horny Which yeah, obviously so, increases your evolutionary Like advantage But also <laughs> level 3 Well Yeah so the, 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 the three levels of Psilocybin dosing Low dose chemical binoculars Second, higher doses, stimulant increases sexual activity, favours human reproduction. I should also say, it favours reproduction between groups of mushroom users, because mushroom users will recognise mushroom users. So a normal dumb ape... From a distance. You'll get, you'll get a troop of apes, <laughs> see another troop of apes. If none of them are using mushrooms, they'll kill each other, because it's a dominator society, not a partnership society, mm. like, which look is at chimps, very by psychedelic use. You give so, chimps mushrooms, they turn into bonobos. Yeah, Fact. But he, yes. <laughs> and, and I, uh, I want to give. I'll, I'll, I'll read, I, I want to see. I want to see somebody give chimps a pack, a troop of chimps, magic mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> well, this this is what organizations like Maps are for. <laughs> I don't want them looking at humans. I want them being apes, mushrooms, psychedelic science. <laughs> so. So that's that's level two. That's level two is another reason why magic mushrooms are such an an evolutionary advantage. Because as soon as two troops of chimps or whatever hominid forebear we're talking about take mushrooms, mushrooms instead of immediately attacking each other, they're gonna have sex. They're gonna reproduce. They're gonna have more mushroom yeah. babies. They're, they're, they've won. <laughs> they've won the evolutionary arms race. There you go. Humans. Three, the <laughs> highest. Yeah, humans. You get humans. Well, when I say mushroom babies, I'm using that interchangeably with Homo sapiens. <laughs> it's like that scene out two thousand one Space Odyssey, you know, when it's the babe, the the, the, the star baby the, comes the monolith, the mushroom baby, <laughs> the, giant it's mushroom. the big mushroom. <laughs> but Kubrick, Kubrick level, on the level, level three, the highest doses, full blown shamanic ecstasy, Few, full blown reality. Full blown this is hominid reality. Hominid reality. This is nine <laughs> grams hominid. of dried cubies straight into your brain. You get <laughs> ego dissolution. It promotes community bonding and, most importantly, group sex. Gorgeous. I'm not. I'm not embellishing that. That is actually he. He says very important. No, no. Like it quote it. Group sex. Quote it. Read it. Read it. Read it. <laughs> Oh well, I've got a quote. It's it's um, the tendency to regulate and schedule sexual activity within the group by linking it to a lunar cycle of mushroom availability may have been important as a first step towards ritual and religion. Now this as is a clear can, example of see, where he hedges his language by using the word "may." He then may. proceeds to does to, to treat it as if it is just true that, that i would also like to point out got high on the full moon <laughs> yeah. and had orgies mushroom orgies. those of you who are less well educated and might think that a more obvious lunar cycle or something that is roughly in periodicity with the moon that the menstrual cycle might regulate sexual activity you're wrong it's actually the mushroom growing cycle that is much more proximate to human sexuality than a menstrual cycle Yes. Obviously, science. Obviously. Go read a uh, book. So, and one of the important mechanisms that... Does he discuss this in this book? I, I don't know if this is something that somebody you've, else You've read said. more than one Terence McKenna book? This, <laughs> this is the only Terence McKenna I've read. <laughs> no, or if this is just something floating around in the psychedelic hippie verse uh, of like, if you have a community orgy, then... 
Uh, you don't know who's the father of which kid, so you have more incentive for the men in particular to like look after the children uh, because they don't know which one's theirs. Whereas, like, well, if, I mean, if you have a clear, if you have a clear patrilineal like line, you can you know which kid comes from which father, and there's not too much cucking going on. Then, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> then you've got like you've got reasons why, like, if I have my kid, I know that's my kid, and I know that other kid is Jack's kid, so I will kill that kid, and I kill Jack. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Um, unless we, but yeah. unless we have an that, orgy, we live in a society where we all take mushrooms. That hasn't happened. Also, neither of us yeah. have kids. But <laughs> well, I mean, this clearly Plato in writing the Republic and talking about a similar problem foresaw McKenna brought back to ancient <laughs> Greece the the knowledge, probably having communed with McKenna in the future using mushrooms <laughs> and wrote it in the Republic. This is well. Clearly, the oracle at Delphi was getting getting mushed out of her brains. Yeah, no. communing with McKenna. It, it goes without saying. I would like to add a few things on on the subject of <laughs> mushroom mutagenicity. Proceed. Yeah, so McKenna does demonstrate his his scientific credentials by saying he he brings up an objection that might seem obvious. That if taking mushrooms entails such a low cost and gives such benefits, why why would we encode in our genomes effectively mushroom advantages when we can just eat the mushrooms? Why not just eat them? He answers this by saying, And yet we all have these enhancements without taking mushrooms. So how did the mushroom modifications get into the genome? He has elegantly answered the question, by saying, nah, you're wrong. I'm right. <laughs> He's, he fixed it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. We have the mushroom <laughs> modifications in our genomes. He also... This is somewhat related. This is related to visual acuity. I just wanted to, um, to bring this quote in because it's... Uh, well, it addresses, it addresses a... An important issue, one that is getting worse in our society. He does not. He doesn't propose a solution, but lack of orgies. He frames it well. That that's one among many. But this is an even more important problem. <laughs> so, as for visual acuity, perhaps the widespread need for corrective lenses among modern humans is a legacy of the long period of artificial enhancement of vision through psilocybin use. Science. Yet. You 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 seeing where he's coming from? There's a lot of four-eyed freaks walking around who don't have enough visual acuity and are relying on exogenous visual acuity when mm. they could be relying on chemical visual acuity. Maybe that's a way of our bodies. But that's how our bodies are telling us that we're we're effectively psychedelic deficient. We're psilocybin deficient. Psychedelically saying, deficient. I, I like yeah, that. It's saying, hey, Jack, <clears throat> do you think I that could be like a vitamin D deficiency? Like you could go down to the doctor and be like, oh, I'm feeling a bit unwell. It takes your bloods. Oh, you're a little bit low in mushy. It's mate. vitamin P. You've got psilocybin. A, <laughs> I think you've got a psychedelic deficiency. I'm going to give you a prescription eight grams of psilocybin mushrooms a day for the next week. See if that does the job. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be seeing pretty clearly. <laughs> so, I th- I think I think we've worked out how humans evolved. Dumb apes, psychedelics. There's some sort of magic that we tried to sort out, but I I'm not sure we did it justice. You have us. Now the question. Yeah, is, I feel like it's that thing from South Park where it's like. <laughs> Step one, steal some underpants. Step two, I don't know. Step three, profit. <laughs> step one, yep. take some mushies. Step two, step three, humans. <laughs> humans. Yeah. So, so now that now that that has been firmly established, unimpeachably, we're going to proceed forward. 
with that as an operational basis for the rest of for the rest of the conversation. This is true. And when this is taking when an Levi says axiom. we, he means this in a in an all encompassing way. It's all humans. <laughs> in, Upon I speak on behalf truth, of science. <laughs> yeah. Upon hearing this truth, you cannot help but be convinced. And so we, a global we, will continue on now with this as <laughs> as an operating assumption. We've got to work out what this plant was that that um, stimulated the hominid mind and led to modern humans. We've already spoiled it. We've spoiled the narrative arc. Magic mushroom. Well, sorry. What? <laughs> we fucked well, it. What, yeah, well, what did this? He, um, so what are the possible alternatives, Jack? Well, how about, first of all, he, he went through a list of things that the, this Ur plant... The, the the fountainhead of all knowledge had had <laughs> to fill. There, there are certain constraints. <laughs> These constraints so <laughs> were one must be an African plant. That's where modern humans arose. You know, it it, it doesn't help if this thing is growing in Antarctica. Can't use yeah. it, so it has to be an African plant. Okay, wait, wait. Let's like that's a reasonable like. Let's just give him credit, right? Like that's, that's not that's not unreasonable. Okay, I, that's I'm, like, I'm, yeah, okay, I'm being a dickhead. Enough. I that's not that's not fair. If you if you take <laughs> as a given that that the necessary condition for human evolution was that we ate some sort of psychedelic plant or fungus, then yes, that's that's not an unreasonable assumption. And you take take it that humans originated in Africa, then one and one equals three. Yeah, yeah, ba- basically, basically. So, number two, must be native to grassland because this is where our ancestors expanded their omnivorous diets, expanded their consciousness. I'll give him that. Yeah. I'll give him. I'll give, give him, him that. that. I'll give him. I'll give him that. Sure. <laughs> Three. Must require no preparation. So he he says, say DMT. In, this is in a clever grasses. one. This is a clever one. This is a clever one. DMT in grasses, you need to isolate. You, if you're going to ingest it orally, it needs to be with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Or, so or you've this got is a very good smoke it or vaporize it. So it needs to be something that a dumb ape who's foraging just picks up, sticks in their mouth, and then suddenly their visual acuity is bonkers. Their capacity for language <laughs> they're horny. is crazy. They're having and their communion sex. with the machine elves. Communion so with the machine elves. The, the logic here, needs to be I think, to is reasonable is essentially cooking is a technology that requires... Like, other animals don't cook. So cooking is after the, yeah. the leap to hominid. After so, you stop therefore, being a dumbass. It can't... After you stop being a stupid chimp. Like, so, therefore, this thing mustn't have required any preparation whatsoever. Yeah. Which narrows the scope of possible candidates. Yeah. Where he, he really engaged in a very uh, Arthur Conan Doyle sort of style... Elimination of of uh, alternative hypotheses. Mm-hmm. So let, let's yeah. let's keep on going. So there's four. It must be easily available to a nomadic population. So these people weren't living settled lives; they were nomadic. So you can't just have this this little oasis, this little Eden, where there are there, there are yeah, like one little this, this magic one, plant. It needs to be all over the place. It One needs to be grove. something that a foraging hominid comes across, eats, and discovers... At least every two weeks. Yeah, discovers every, the vegetable the full logos. And then five, As Peterson would must, say. must confer immediate and tangible benefits to those who eat it. And we've gone over those immediate and tangible benefits. The, <laughs> the, the obvious benefits of taking mushrooms. So, well, so... Now that we've got like, the, the constraints in place, in, we can talk about things mushrooms that... Ingesting mushrooms is yeah. not as... Yeah. Oh, sorry. I think that was... No, go like, on. I go was on. just going to be... I was being an idiot. <laughs> yeah, so, so thinking, we're going to be idiots for this entire podcast. <laughs> I was just going to say, technically speaking, mushrooms... Ingest, ingesting mushrooms is not as immediate as vaping DMT. However, vaping DMT mm. requires that you have an understanding of... Such things as electrodynamics. <laughs> well, that that, that, that crystallised DMT. Number three. So that 
that violate violates uh, rule, the yeah, constraint three. <laughs> so clearly, <laughs> we were ingesting mushrooms before we were vaping DMT. Before we were making <laughs> grape flavored DMT vape juice, <laughs> blasting off into hyperspace using that. So what what are what are some candidates that we can reject? So there's there's ibogaine, which comes from, and I apologize for my pronunciation. Of these these scientific plant names, I'm I'm an imbecile. It's ibogaine. I think so. So it's it's from the plant Tabernathy iboga, and it's iboga. used by those of the Bwiti religion among the Fang of Gabon. He says Zaire, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo from the year 1997, I think. So. He says that this is probably not... Well done, Jack. A... You're clearly a hominid. I'm clearly... A... Well, I mean, I took my morning dose of magic mushrooms, so that's why I'm switched on. <laughs> I'm glad that you know when, when, when Zaire became the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's a very strange <laughs> fact to know off the top of your head. <laughs> you know, I might be totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you really... You could have said anything and I would have believed you. <laughs> it's all about confidence. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you're wrong. You just have to say it confidently. <laughs> and then offer a qualification afterwards so you can scurry away if you did get it wrong. So <laughs> the problem the problem with Ibogaine is that, yes, it is, it is a visionary plant. It is a visionary chemical. But there's, at least according to McKenna, because I don't actually know this, there's no evidence of a long history of use. It's also not a grassland plant. And at small doses, this is really important, it impairs visual acuity at small doses. Whoa, game yeah. over! Game over! Bang, game yeah. Game over for Ibogaine. Finished. That's eliminated. That's not to say it's not a worthwhile plant. Um, it's so worthwhile, we should do it. We should do point. it. But, but not in order to evolve into an even greater yeah, hominid. Exactly. Because so, it will impair our visual acuity. Are we the crazy ones? 100,000 listeners special. Jack and Levi take Ibogaine take on camera. Take Ibogaine <laughs> on camera and, get, and talk about, I don't know, the next McKenna book. Well, we'll write the next McKenna book. The E <laughs> Ching. So, we know that it's not Ibogaine. He also says it can't be DMT found in grasses for, re for reasons that we discussed earlier. DMT is broken down really, really quickly in the human body, so you either need to, to inhale it, so you smoke it or vape it, so it, it gets into your bloodstream really quickly before it can At be a high enough up. concentration so that you can yep. blast off. Or you multiverse. take it with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor to prevent... And then you can get... You can get broiled in your own DMT juices for twelve hours straight as you shit yourself. <laughs> A few hours. And you it's an emetic as well, so you just shit yourself and throw up. <laughs> what while you're tripping balls and there's and there's a shaman you know, shaking some marikas over the top of you and you're talking to you in some language you don't understand. I just like you what is appealing thing, about this if, experience? If I were given <laughs> If I were given the opportunity, I probably would do it. I would 100% do it. I would like to do it. I can do it. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, <laughs> however, I, I mean, I would like to do it. Yes, it sounds like an incredible experience from other people's reports. It sounds like a worthwhile thing mm. to do. However, I can't say I look forward to one, but I would do it. <laughs> they also do like, some of them also do like, like various types of tobacco or whatever uh, ceremonies beforehand, like sort of uh, like detoxing or whatever, or like you don't eat for like a day or whatever, <laughs> so it just like just pummels you. <laughs> <laughs> just the pile driver of DMT. But he... He... he after setting out his... Um, his his preconditions for what what this ur plant must be after after eliminating DMT in grasses and Tabernathy iboga, he he then goes on to say that it's actually Strafaria cubensis, magic mushrooms 
likely grown. We also need to rule quickly of cattle. Rule out quickly rule out uh, LSD because LSD is a modern drug. Yeah, that was synthesized. And in, when was LSD synthesized by? In Hoffman. like the fifties by Hoffman. Yeah, like fifties, fifty two or something like that, right? Yeah, and then kind of like blew up in the sixties. So like, mm-hmm. uh, so that's a modern drug, and even ergot. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know that contains a fungus that grows on like wheat and barley and stuff. Uh, even that you could say, well, uh, our domestication of those sorts of crops that actually contain ergot didn't happen until much later anyway. So it's the same thing with like vaping DMT. You can't create agriculture if you're not already mm-hmm. a hominid, right? So you yeah. better have the m- mushies first. Okay, what else? Oh, peyote. Well, also ergot's believe... got a bunch of other problems because it's. It's inconsistent. So sometimes you'll have a visionary. Yeah, and experience. sometimes you'll just get sometimes poisoned and just die. Sometimes you just get poisoned and die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, yeah. And even yeah, you, you something like the like mescaline. I, I don't did he explicitly rule out mescaline, but I, I believe you could rule out he mescaline. He doesn't talk about it much. Right? But mescaline but I think is rule out mescaline. Is not found in Africa, right? So, yeah. as far as I'm aware, there aren't any mescaline contained. They're pre- predominantly found in in, in cacti, like uh, was it the Devil's Breath or whatever it's called? Um, it's it's in a, it's in a few. It's in San Pedro. Peyote. It's in San Pedro. Yeah, it's in peyote. And also eating those cacti. As someone who who tried blending up a foot of San Pedro and drinking it, it's pretty hard to keep it down. It's not. It's yeah, not, it's not something that not you can pick experience. up off the ground. And munch on it. And it's covered in spikes. Eat, it's disgusting. Eat three kilograms of, 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 of San Pedro off the ground. It's not going to happen. So we're just ruling out a couple of others just in case any inquisitive yeah. viewers were wondering. Would Aminita San Pedro Muscaria? be a candidate? Aminita yeah, so Muscaria. Aminita Muscaria, he discusses this one at length because it was actually an alternative that mm-hmm. is considered by some other early researchers of these questions. Which he doesn't like, <laughs> uh, but at least in part, uh, it doesn't fulfill the. Uh, well, it's not it's not terribly psychedelic on the one hand, and two, I don't believe it hits the visual acuity thing, right? No, no, it um it 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 worsens your visual acuity. Mostly, it makes you feel really bad. Yeah, it's very inconsistent in terms of bringing on visionary states of mind of shamanic ecstasy shamanic ecstasy. and yeah so I it doesn't don't... hit level two and three so maybe even yeah. if you hit level, level and I don't so think it even, even if you hit level three in the right place it doesn't go in the right place and even it's... if you hit level three and you get visions you're not going through levels two one and two you're not getting mm. visual acuity and, and like horny and stuff first right yeah so, so siberian tribes people used it and may still use it but wrong place i mean you've you need you need to have already evolved to get to be a Siberian tribes person. Yeah, you need to the, the evolve. You need to in front of the take take food of the gods X, migrate out of Africa into Siberia, mm-hmm. and then figure out how to take Amanita muscaria and not exactly. die. Exactly. And taking Amanita muscaria will be part of a process that we'll discuss later, which is. How human society, to a large extent, has been concerned with trying to recapture this lost Eden, this lost African grassland where, where Strophaeria cubensis were plentiful, where we could commune with vegetable intelligence freely, and we we we. Now this is an interesting point that we should talk about, Jack. Is that he he literally was there anything else on that point before I bring this up? Well, there was a bit about... He, he does talk about why plants make hallucinogens, which is worth bringing up. It doesn't have to be... Yeah, now. so my point can... No, my now. point can is, 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 uh, can come after that because I was going to talk about plant communication. So we, let's talk about that. Yes, one exactly. Well, plant okay, communication. Well, it's not just plant communication. It's communication throughout nature. So he talks about nature as this unified whole. We... We, in, in our dominator culture, adult minds, think of nature as this permanent state of warfare where 
organisms are trying to outcompete each other to pass on their genes to expand Blood at the expense of others. Whereas nature is not so red in tooth and claw, it is a fundamentally cooperative process or a cooperative being. It's, it's only we humans under the influence of dominator culture that don't understand this. It's, mm. You might think a lion eating a gazelle is, is an act of adversarial nature, but it's not. It's, um, I, don't, I don't know how actually to explain the that. The gazelle the has taken paradigm, We can just ignore it. And realise that it should contribute to the whole and has yeah. sacrificed itself willingly to, be, to, to nourish the, the lion. Exactly. It's, its screams of pain are, are an illusion. They, it's, so, they're actually screams of joy in being a part of the wholeness of nature. <laughs> so, 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 pl- so, wait, wait, wait. Okay, to what degree, without <clears throat> taking the piss too much, like, to what degree is he kind of right? Okay, for example, tree, the Not roots much. of trees. No, no, wait, let's come... Jack, Jackie. Jack. I, okay, no, I, I, I will, I will Jack. put on my internet anthropologist hat. <laughs> Come on, you've undergone a lot of rigorous training in order to be able to have these critical conversations. <laughs> <laughs> okay, trees have roots. I, yeah, Those no, roots, I agree, can communicate with one, with with the trees can communicate via. Uh, chemical signals from in in their root system so that like if one tree is infected they can be putting out like chemical signals into the soil and the other trees can, can like know that there's an infection going on and do whatever they need to do to protect themselves okay that's one thing okay eukaryotes like you know the large uh networks of fungi the really the really the soil fungi they communicate quote unquote communicate or have chemical relationships with the root systems of trees, for example, right? So is there some truth in, in McKenna's point that, like, uh, networks of plants and, and fungi and stuff uh, in some way, like, communi- sort of living symbiotically through chemical communication? I must agree. Okay, great. So he's right. Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, there we go, we can end. <laughs> Everyone should read Food of the Gods, Everyone should okay, read everything but written. However, out. however, okay, now this is where, okay, so this is where, okay, now whether or not you call that communication is up for debate. Is that, well, is that communication? <laughs> he calls it Go language on. because he says it involves signal processing. Well, here's the thing, there's, here we go. Okay, cool, okay, so. Two trees have a network of roots. There's chemical exchange between the roots of one tree and another. Okay, maybe certain chemical signatures are only released on certain conditions. So we're going to grant, just just for the sake of argument, that that is communication in some way. Then, is there language? Is there actually language? And then finally, if humans ingest a chemical... That chemical enters our central nervous system, such as psilocybin crossing the blood-brain barrier, and interacting with our central nervous system. He is then saying that interaction there is a form of communication, and it's not just communication; it's actually language. The mushrooms are speaking to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he describes it as an exopheromone, so a, a yeah. signaling molecule that acts across species barriers. What do they call that thing? Uh, do the, you know, the bodybuilding.com, they say don't eat soy because it's a... Uh, it's, a it's a phytoestrogen. And it's a phytoestrogen. It turn, turns you into a so this soy is, boy. This would be like a phyto... <laughs> say attention to a soy boy. <laughs> this would be like a phyto or a myco exopheromone. Yeah, I suppose... I suppose so. He, um... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, so, so he takes this as evidence that because humans respond in such a way to psilocybin and to some other compounds produced by plants or fungi and enter into a hallucinogenic state that means that they're 
there there is a unity to nature that nature is producing these signaling molecules to communicate with humans so nature through in, in, the in mushroom evolution is communicating evolution, with humans though, when we're tripping yeah i mean i'm just not sure how that and nature sort of writ large evolved. with a capital n gaia yeah. gaia is communicating with humans through the mushroom. That's the that's the logic. That's the that's the argument that he's putting forward, basically. Yeah, and th- th- this is one of the few the few places where McKenna and I diverge. In that, to me, that implies <laughs> oh. some sort of teleology, some Check. end point that nature nature has decided beforehand that humans are going to be able to interpret this signal from plants. In which case, you would, you would question, well, why isn't it more widely available? Why isn't it in every plant so that we can easily interact with it? Because, because and, it's and why isn't the experience more consistent? And why aren't we all be giving the, given the same, the same message? Yeah, because the way, the way it is at the moment, we lost this African Eden with magic mushrooms growing everywhere. And as such we moved away from partnership societies into dominator societies, which is bad for nature. He, he directly links this to environmental destruction. So yeah. if we were given this ability, why, isn't, why don't all plants just produce psilocybin? Or why isn't it just endogenously produced and we have a steady state of reality juice in our brains? <laughs> I, I'm inclined to think that it's so largely accidental that it, it interacts with a particular, I think it's a particular subclass of serotonin receptors in our brains. But then again, maybe I'm one male and therefore my role is really <laughs> to have good visual acuity and to throw spears at things. And not think and stop thinking. Two, right? <laughs> a product of dominator culture. I think those two uh, details... Uh, rule you out as being able to have a valid yeah. opinion, Jack. Damn. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Foiled. Well, in, in that case, yeah, I'll, I will give myself over entirely to the to the gospel of Terry. But he, how come he doesn't levy that criticism against himself? Well, no. because mag- psychedelics are because he's had feminine. sufficient. He's he's been feminized by the yeah. sufficiently feminized by the psychedelic mushrooms, and he's able to interpret somehow. Terence McKenna is able to interpret with high fidelity the intentions and the message of these mushrooms and commune them to us, communicate them to us. Precisely, because one of the most profound things that happens when you take a lot of psychedelics is you commune with the transcendent other. Capital T, capital O. Capital O. <laughs> yeah, precisely. And the, the, the transcendent other is defined in a few ways in Fruit of the Gods, but mostly it seems to be the, the transcendent other is true nature, capital N nature, I, I need to emphasise, truly perceived. It's a... It's a Probably, or at least in my reading, it is it's some sort of independent entity of humanity that you commune with when you take psychedelics. See, it's not entirely like... Have you ever had a psychedelic experience, Jack? I think we've answered <laughs> that a few times already. <laughs> well, if you had, I don't want to assume anything. <laughs> <laughs> However, we've 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 had psychedelic experiences together. <laughs> <laughs> However, I don't know how amenable that experience is to any sort of consistent characterization. <laughs> <laughs> to just to say the transcendent other it's like yes i have a shitload of psilocybin bouncing around my central nervous system and it's making all the wrong neurons fire <laughs> in all the wrong ways i don't know if i can like pull back from those experiences anything 
other than to say that it's a very strange experience. But then is it yeah. some sort of transcendent other in this kind of like, I don't know, deific sort of or, or whatever, like pan psych psychism sort of view of like, okay, you're literally communicating with something that is actually there. However, in your sober state, you don't perceive or interact with it and you need this chemical in order to induce that interaction. I, I think that's a big, big fucking step. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe I just haven't haven't had enough psychedelic experiences, but it's it's hard to know what... If you're being given a message, it's hard to work out what it is. I I would say it's nigh impossible to <laughs> <laughs> And that the higher the dose you take, the, the more difficult it is. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to concentrate on those sorts of things when you can't remember your own name. And then and then and then the 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 the, the retort one could retort, well, Jack, you fucking male dominator pig, you—you mm-hmm. <laughs> you have not actually undergone one of these experiences, facilitated by a trained shaman of a lineage that has the knowledge of how to interpret and how to guide these experiences properly. Yeah, that's true. But what about the first—not even the first humans, but the first hominids to have come across magic mushrooms? Because they presumably wouldn't have had shamans. So they developed the school the by, pra- by taking enough mushrooms. They started developing like it's like the Platonic Academy, but of mushies. Hmm. So, from whence springs the first philosophers? You know, right? Hmm. Anaximander and whatnot. They were just chatting in the same way, analogously. Hmm. Like maybe these proto hominids were just mushing out. And they realized through their chatting that they could establish, like, here's how, here's like a methodology for correctly understanding the experience. Mm-hmm. And now the shaman all around the world, wherever they are, are ultimately descendants of that school of knowledge about how to interpret these experiences. You could hypothetically, like, by that logic, if you take enough mushrooms, you could actually derive these insights yourself, no? Like the early proto-hominids. It would make sense that it's sort of like Protestantism versus Catholicism. It's yes. your personal relationship with the, with the, the unbounded vegetable consciousness. You can achieve this state yourself. Where do you fall? Are you more of a, an orthodox shamanist sort of person? You need to go to school... You need to go to the church, as in have the guided experience. Or do you? Are you more of a? It's a personal. You're more of a Protestant Anglican, like softball. It's your personal relationship with the mushroom. Well, given that my only experiences with the mushroom and it's, it's would you be open to personal. going to mushroom school with a trained shaman? No, oh, I'd give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> If the option were open to me, I wouldn't say no. <laughs> Interesting. What about you? I I would like to give it a go. I think it would be a worthwhile experience. I'm I am I'm highly skeptical. <laughs> However, uh, yes, I think <laughs> quite skeptical. You can't, strictly speaking, having even had the psychedelic experiences. They are an extremely strange thing, and I don't really know what to like how to make sense of them. So, I think it's it is important to main even though you need to maintain skepticism because you don't just want to have like some random garbage like pumped into your brain by like a bunch of, like a bunch of nonsense, right? But at the same time, I think you can remain open minded, right? That's sort of the guiding philosophy of "Are We the Crazy Ones?" as a podcast. Yeah, I, I guess I guess it is. <laughs> try try to be charitable. Maybe they're seeing something that you're not. But retain a healthy skepticism. <laughs> uh.
Tune in next time for part two of our discussion of Food of the Gods.